We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela, Dei Mater Alma, Ad Semper Virgo, Felix And welcome everybody, Steve Cunningham back again with Christine Wuhar? Wuhar. Wuhar. Uh-huh. Uh, Frasati USA, based in Nashville, Tennessee, to discuss Pierre Giorgio Frasati, who many people may know, may know, may not know, uh, is a blessed in the church. She's an incorrupt, and I wanted to do something for a long time. You can ask people like Father Nix, etc. I've been pounding to do sermons or something on him. So since we started doing these programs, I said well, we're going to do it ourselves. So Christine, Great. thank you for saying yes and coming on. And there's a common error that's around about his name. Could you explain that for everyone? Yeah, I think it's an American thing because we see his name, when you see it spelled, when you see his name written out, you see Pier Giorgio Frasati. And so everyone thinks that Pierre is his first name, Giorgio his middle name, and Frasati his last name, and so they call him Pierre. People will write to me and they say, oh, I love Pierre, Pierre. And I'm like, Pierre, who's Pierre? Um, or they put P-I-E-R-R-E, like they make it all in French, Pierre Frasanti. But anyway, um, Pierre Giorgio is his first name. Uh, his middle name is actually Michelangelo. Um, his mother was a an, an artist, a, a big artist, but he wasn't named, I don't think, for Michelangelo the painter, but it's actually a family name. Um, there's a relative in his ancestry, Michelangelo. So so his name is Pier Giorgio, and when it was ever shortened in the family, he himself would uh, write Giorgio. His friends would call him Giorgio, Giorgetto. If he wrote in German, he would write Georg for George. So it's rule number one uh, of a real devotee of Pier Giorgio would never say Pierre. <laughs> Very okay. good. So- who and that's was my litmus it? test. You know, that's my litmus test on uh, when I answer email and all of that. The ones that say Pierre, I kind of have to like, I hold off a little bit, I must admit. <laughs> and all right, I got to answer them. There's and sometimes I'll button. send people back a link about it. And I'm like, I don't mean this to sound negative, but it's just important to get somebody's name right. We all like to be called by our, our right name. That's, as interesting to Michelangelo one, I, uh, there's a book I'm reading on him and it mentioned Michelangelo, his full name. And I asked, I thought that too, thinking, Oh, I wonder if it was the painter. Yeah, it probably didn't hurt because his mother was a, a fantastic artist and that was important to her. But it was actually a family name. Yeah. So who was he? Well, I mean, he was born. Pierre Giorgio was born in 1901. Uh-huh. But when you look at a picture of him, he looks like he could have been born in 2001. And I think that's the... Um, the factor that makes him so popular is his relatability. That's really the number one thing that I hear is he's so relatable. Uh, he was born in 1901, and so his his lifetime came during a, I, I mean, coincidentally, kind of like right now, there was, he grew up in a period of uh, World War I happened, which was devastating, fascism, uh, was on the rise as he became a young adult and into his early 20s. Um, there was a lot of anti-clericalism, which we kind of have now in our culture with the attacks on the church. So it was it was kind of a turbulent time for him to be growing up. He was born when Pope Leo the Thirteenth was Pope, and Pope Leo the Thirteenth, of course, wrote the great uh, foundational encyclical um, on social justice true Catholic social teaching, rerum novarum. And that guided Pierre Giorgio a lot in his lifetime, that period of fighting for the rights of the workers and uh, and, and so on. So it was a real um, full period of history, I think, when he when he was born and what he grew up with. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, when she says anti-clericalism, uh, there was a part that if somebody would say there's a priest on the train, the train would not move because there was a priest on it. Uh, yeah, right. His sister said that. His sister wrote in uh, one of the uh, 
uh, introductions to a particular chapter of one of her books that if so, uh, all it took was for someone to say there's a priest on the train and and he experienced uh times when they would be on a train it would stop and the you know the fascists would come on and you know heavy-handedly and pierre georgia would stand up to all of that he was never afraid to stand up for the church and he was kind of like an enforcer in a way a lot of times he would be in the position of the the bodyguard of the clergy because there were a lot of eucharistic processions or just regular processions they still do that in italy it's a beautiful thing to go through the streets with some kind of prayer but he would be always like the guy that was on the edge of the crowd to prevent anything from getting really ugly I mean, he was a strong physical guy so but he was a peaceful man but he was prepared to you know he didn't believe in violence but um he was prepared to do what he had to do to defend the church his house his family and so on yeah if you I read mean, his who believes in violence really but i mean he didn't he wasn't a promoter of violence mm -hmm. but of course he was going to do what he had to do to to defend himself in the church and the family yeah, there's a uh, you know everyone knows about francis de sales being a man of uh, that had an anger issue but there's a book uh by was it called the uh, last gentleman's gentleman saint when there's a, a guy a guy comes up to him and takes his hat off and in french culture that was a pretty bad thing to do and Oh, really? He looks at him in the face and goes, your religion tells you to turn the other cheek. And he goes, yes, I know what my religion says, but I don't know if I'm going to act on it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and he handed him the hat back. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you read George, uh, Pierre Giorgio's writings or speeches, they are, they're fantastic. Yeah, they, they get you fired up just reading them 60 years later, you know, 70 years later. You know, think Catholic. Yeah. Uh yeah, I, I really think, like he says in one of them, how it just reading what Mussolini said, it made his blood boil, uh, you know, um, that, that good men will trample on their consciences just for wealth and so on. Kind of, you know, there's so many parallels still to today in so many ways with his story, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, he was, he, he loved saints who were full of zeal, fiery uh, zealous, who, people who really stood for what they wanted. When Pierre Giorgio became a third order Dominican, he took for his name as a Dominican, Girolamo Savonarola, mm -hmm. which most people would have taken like Aquinas and, you know, like little nice Dominican names. And he didn't even hesitate. He took Savonarola, who still is in a little bit of a um, like controversial position, even though there are some people wanting his cause for canonization to go forward. But he loved the reformers and the people who really believed uh, what the church taught and were willing to stand for it. So um, I think that's another thing that makes him relatable is he was courageous um, in defending the church. He believed what he believed and he didn't back down. So, and, and they say people never made fun of Pierre Giorgio because he was a 24 seven uh, guy. He wasn't um, compartmentalizing his faith. What he believed, he believed and that guided how he lived his life minute to minute. So he was the real deal and we need that. We need people that you know where they stand and they're gonna, they're not gonna let you down. And he, he, wouldn't, he would not let you down then or now. Yeah, I remember there was uh, one incident where Mussolini said something about your God has five minutes to take out his enemy and he brings out a stopwatch and puts it down and then mocks him after five minutes. Uh, yeah, you can, in the, in, the read, in the reading of it, you can feel Pierre Giorgio's blood boiling. <laughs> yeah. This. You know, what's really interesting to me, um, he made such an impression on people that there is a book, it's only in Italian and it's, it's kind of biographical, well, it's autobiographical, biographical about his sister's life, Luciana, his younger sister. And she, of course, survived him, um, lived to be 105 years old. And her life was incredible because when she died, one of her sons said to me, you know, people always talked about my mother because of her writing about Pier Giorgio, her brother. But my mother was a hero for, uh, for many other reasons. And one of the things she did was stand up to Mussolini. And in that book about her life, um, she, she would go in and meet with Mussolini one-on-one. -on -one. And, and, and he, he actually asks her about her brother, Pier Giorgio. And when I read that book, I just thought, now think about a guy like that who 
knew Pier Giorgio was a good person. And all of those years after his death would say about an impact that Pier Giorgio kind of had on him, like the impression that he made. So I thought that was, it just was interesting. Pier Giorgio would have not stood for Mussolini and what he did, but Mussolini, Pier Giorgio was on Mussolini's radar, you know, years later. It's just interesting the impact that he had and how he could reach even somebody like that in a certain sense. Yeah, no, very much so. I mean, the first time I he got on my radar was uh, the book uh, Jesus King of Love that uh, I don't know it. Uh, I just went Father Matteo it was is the author the uh, Apostle of the Sacred Heart, and he writes about the Catholic Action League that Pier Giorgio and uh, it was a blessed uh, Giuseppe uh, the dentist. I can't think his last name. There was quite a few blessings in it where all these men would gather in a church to do all night adoration on Thursday nights. Uh, it just blew me away that these guys, and he, I think he led the group or something like that. He would go to adoration for like, they would have adoration for the students. Mm -hmm. They would have adoration times for the workers. Um, and so he was always going. It, it, they would put out flyers, you know, it's hard to step back into time and not think of things like like in our own environment now, like no Facebook or Instagram or anything, no, no social media, that you got your news from the newspaper, not even from the radio. And whenever there was an event like adoration, they would have to put out flyers and send them around and let everybody know. And his mother would see those flyers and like hide them because she didn't want him to necessarily be out all night in adoration. She was worried about him health wise. But he was there. He was there for whether it was the workers, if it were priests, if it were students, he was there. Yeah, that was a huge part of his, his life. Now, there was another book called, the, or was it John Paul II that said that he was a man of the Beatitudes. What can you describe, you know, what made that call, what, what made the Holy Father say that about him? Yeah, that's actually a great story. So the Holy Father before he was the Pope was Cardinal Wojtyla of Krakow. Mm -hmm. And Pier Giorgio's sister, Luciana, married a Polish, true nobility, a Polish man. And the Polish Dominicans in Krakow were having an um, a retreat for students. And they asked to do, they wanted to do a display, like an exhibit, again, before computers, before uh, PowerPoint presentations and all that kind of thing. So they would do good old fashioned exhibits of blowing up pictures and um, cutting out type and putting them on there. And they had an exhibit with a lot of photos of Pier Giorgio. He wasn't beatified or anything, okay? And they asked the Archbishop, the Cardinal Wojtyla to come over and open that student um, retreat and he went over and he saw the exhibit all of the pictures now he had a devotion in a way he he had known of Pier Giorgio because John Paul II he was involved in Catholic action that you were just talking about so Pier Giorgio became almost a legendary figure in Catholic action after his death and so Pope John Cardinal Wojtyla seeing the exhibit and all of these pictures very excitedly said go and behold the man of the eight beatitudes who brings to us the joy of the gospel so he kind of just you know enthusiastically responded to seeing those pictures go and behold the man of the eight beatitudes who proclaims the good news of the gospel so then um uh, several years later they uh, wanda pierre Giorgio's niece she was asked to do something in Rome at the North American College. And they were like, well, what would you call this? What would be the title of this exhibit? And uh, she said, well, there was a, um, there's an obscure Polish cardinal who called him the man of the a Beatitudes once. So they decided to use that again as the title for their exhibit at, in Rome. And then lo and behold, the obscure Polish cardinal becomes the Pope, one of the greatest popes of all time. And when he was uh, beatifying Pier Giorgio in 1990 at St. Peter's in his homily, he again referred to him as the man of the Beatitudes. And so it came, became more of a universal official kind of title. But, uh, so it's kind of a neat story because he really named him that mm -hmm. um, as, as the Cardinal of, uh, of Krakow. And then officially was able to really put it um, out there as Pope. Because yeah, he was very joyful, liked, loved his family, had great friends, was a very friendly individual to others, protected workers, as you mentioned earlier. 
a uh, very prayerful, holy guy. Uh, what was some of his uh, devotions uh, that he had? Well, the main thing with Pietro Giorgio was um, it's always said that he the two poles of his existence, the pillars of his life were the Eucharist and Our Lady, the Blessed Mother. Uh, one of the things that happened to Pier Giorgio that really shaped him was when at 12 years old, he failed Latin in school. And so it, it was a humiliation for him because he had to be taken out of his class and put into a private school. So he was homeschooled initially with his sister. They had a tutor and then they were put together in the public school in the same grade. His mother wanted them to be together to look after each other, even though they were 16 months apart. And then he was in the public school, the state run school when he failed Latin and had to go to the Jesuit run school, which was kind of like an option to go there, make up the work and then rejoin your class, which he did. Mm -hmm. But by going to the Jesuit run school at age of 12 there, they really nourished, I think, what was an innate uh, amount of grace that he had and encouraged him to receive daily communion which he had to get permission for, which is a great story, how he got his mother to give him permission. And they encouraged him to pray rosary daily and to get in, involved in a lot of those devotions. And so that was like when he really took off. Um, he just, his spirituality just took off because he had the influence of those Jesuit fathers. So I think he he loved a lot of the Dominican saints. He, he loved St. Paul. Um, he read a lot of, uh, Aquinas and Augustine and St. Catherine of Siena and so on. But when it came right down to it, it was our Lord in the Eucharist and his love and devotion to the Blessed Mother, who he said, we owe her everything. And, and from the age of 12 until his death, there was rarely a day when he did not go to receive the Eucharist. So that's what um, fed and nourished him and enabled him to do all of the things he did. It's so easy to forget this guy was 24 years old when he died. Yeah. Like everything you read that he wrote or that he did, he basically only had 24 years to, to do all of this. And and I mean, I, I don't even want to think about what I was doing by, by my first 24 years. Forget it. I mean, I have like that, like I think a lot of people, a period where you just want to do over. Um, if I could just delete some of those experiences or whatever yeah. control but belief his, yes <laughs> his life wasn't like that i mean it's really sometimes sometimes even though i've been doing this for quite some time sometimes i will just read something he wrote and say guy was 21 years old when he wrote that or 22 and he had these strong devotions sincere devotions that's why he was such a magnet and could inspire his friends and survive the unhappy home life of his parents and defend the church and do all of the things he did because he was solid on the Eucharist and the Blessed Mother. Yeah, I was, I was thinking when you mentioned uh, Daily Communion and uh, Blessed Giuseppe, they, he would not open his business as a dentist until he went to Mass. And we hear, oh, we don't have enough time, there, we, you know, we can't do this, we got all these excuses, but somehow these guys and were able to do it every day. Could you elaborate on the story that you mentioned about his uh, getting his permission from his mother? Well, sure. It's a big, I think his parents are very misunderstood. Well, I know they are, and I know why. It's because we only have a couple of books by his sister translated into English, and she wrote a, a whole lot more. And a lot of times these translations took on a life of their own. And so we have this image of his parents um, his father being anti-Catholic almost, which wasn't true. It'll say agnostic atheist. And his mother, um, like a Sunday Catholic, in one of the books by his, his sister says, we never saw our mother go to communion. That did not mean she didn't go to communion, but a lot of times, according to his niece, uh, Pierre George's niece, Wanda, they didn't go at the same time or whatever. But Mrs. Frasati was a practicing Catholic, Okay, they weren't waking up and saying prayers and praying before meals and praying the rosary. And they didn't go in the car, you know, but they, they weren't sitting down and doing that. His father was a fallen away Catholic. I think that's the best way to understand the family life as far as spirituality goes. So they had a nun in the house who took care of the grandmother. The father defended the, the Catholic church. They had a lot of priests and cardinals and whatever friends and so on. But spirituality wise, he grew up at a time when you didn't go to communion. Even an adult wouldn't go to communion regularly. 
in Pierre Giorgio's lifetime, we had Pope Pius X, who came along and um, decided that children should be able to receive communion at the age of reason. Mm -hmm. And he encouraged adults to go to communion regularly. So for Mrs. in Mrs. Frassati's defense, this was not even the practice of the church and daily communion. Heck, that wasn't even even an adult wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So when he goes to the Jesuit school and they see in him something special and they encourage him to go to daily communion, she said no. He had to have her permission. She said no, not because she was against or didn't understand the value of the, of the Eucharist, but the opposite. She thought if he went every day, it would become so routine and meaningless. And she didn't want that to happen. And so uh, a few days after he was told no, he came into the rector's office there at the school and he was all excited and he said, oh, vinto, oh, vinto, which means I won, I won. Um, and he kind of used like a lottery term, the priest, and he said, what did you win, Pier Giorgio? And he said, I won permission from my mother to go to communion every day. And the rector kind of, you know, gave him a, like, I hope you didn't give her too hard of a time or whatever. But he just persisted in asking her until she finally said yes. So I can imagine because she was a strong personality, very strong temperament. So I can only imagine how that went between 12 year old Pierre Giorgio with his mother. And she was going against, I guess, her protection of the Eucharist and everything she knew in her whole life about how rarely you would go out of reverence. And then to change over and say out of reverence to allow her son to go. And it transformed him. That daily Eucharist transformed him. So it was a big victory for him um, and, and just shaped the rest of his life. Yeah, the, the quotes he has on the Blessed Sacrament are, like you said, not a 24-year-old or 22-year-old's words usually. Mm -hmm. um, what are some stories that you have that you know of that you wish more people knew of Pierre Giorgio? Um, well, I just thought of one. I'm still not going to say. <laughs> I just thought of one. It makes people nervous. So I won't say. Um, I think most people know that he did so many things for the poor, but they don't know that his parents also did a lot for the poor. And so I think in his background is this over uh, exaggeration of the family life. Because if I'm half Italian, but um, Italian people, you know, they might fight or say things like I always just used to joke and say how we have no tact, but you just kind of say things and move on. I mean, it's not hold, grudge holding, but sometimes I was in a restaurant, for instance, with Pierre Giorgio's two, two of his nieces and uh, the one came in and said to her sister, do something with your hair. And then she looked at me and said, Christine, tell her, do something with your hair. And I thought, I'm, I'm not getting involved with this with you two sisters. But it was just like, and then they move on. And then they go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't really understand the deep love between all of the family members. Because when you read the book and you, you hear the, um, the discord in the home, which there was, his parents did not have a happy marriage. But there was a lot of love in the family. And I think that's misunderstood uh, a lot about him. He was misunderstood in the family, but it wasn't that he was an unloved person. I think also uh, something that shaped his upbringing was the fact that he did have an older sister. Um, the Frasatis had a baby who was born before Pier Giorgio, but only lived eight months. And most people don't know this. Um, his Elda was her name. And so she died before Pier Giorgio was born, obviously. But I think that had a big impact on his mother because I have several friends who lost children. And so the way she raised them, um, a lot of it was, I think, because of fear and protection and so on. Um, Pierre Giorgio had a phenomenal sense of humor. I think people know he was a practical joker, but probably don't know like the extent of it. His good friend, Marco, his best friend when he was an, a, a young adult, Marco joined the Air Force. And Pier Giorgio gave everybody in his little group of friends nicknames. Uh, he and Marco were called the terror, terror wing. Another problem in today's culture, right? Because he would sign letters, terroristically yours, Pier Giorgio, <laughs> uh, or cannon blasts from me and so-and-so, boom, boom, boom. And he wrote Marco a letter uh, in the Air Force like that once. And Marco actually got like uh, quarantined, um, 
and put in isolation while they investigated who is writing to you terroristic readings and all of that. So um, he, he has such a great, rich sense of humor. Uh, people think he was, uh, I don't wanna say, uh, let's say unintelligent. People think he was unintelligent because he had terrible grades. If you look at his grade sheet, he wrote out his grade sheet for college a week before he died and he had it on his door. And the grades are like 60, 65, 70, 75, 80. I mean, they weren't good. But it wasn't because he was um, unintelligent. He spoke several languages. The reason why his grades were like that is because he was out doing everything for the poor. So there's a lot of ways that we um, misunderstand uh, Pierre Giorgio and who he was as well. And um, I don't know, I, some of the things that get exaggerated about him, I sometimes think there's so much uh, to him, substantially to him, that it's not necessary to exaggerate things. And if you want to uh, get to know him better, those things, uh, the truths about him are available. So you don't have to make things up because there's enough there to him. Um, and once Pierre George is a lot like the church, you know, we say that the church uh, is it's shallow enough for a mouse to wade in and deep enough for an elephant or shallow enough for a mouse to swim in, right? And deep enough for an elephant to wade in, something like that. I think that's true of Pierre Giorgio. I think we know so much on uh, one level about him, but if you really go deeper into Pierre Giorgio, you'll be surprised how much he can uh, help you grow spiritually. More than like you said at the beginning, it's a whole lot more than just a guy who loved the mountains and the outdoors, a whole lot more. Yeah, that's mostly what everyone I know that I know talks about is either he's a mountain climber, uh, there's a big sports group with his name all over the United States, uh, smoking a pipe or a cigar. Uh, and that's really about it. From If I ask, well, yeah, what else, is, what else is from him? That's all I got. Uh, so, yeah, that was the main reason coming on. It's like this guy had tremendous devotion and love of country, love of neighbor, love of the church that, as you mentioned, really needed in these times. Pierre Giorgio gave a, a speech once, which it blows my mind. It's in the book. There's a book um, of his letters, letters to his friends and family that we put together. We, we, it was released in English a few years ago, and I got to work on that with his niece, Wanda Gavronska. And he was asked to, I've told this story before, but he was asked to be the godfather of a flag. Um, and in the, in the role of the godfather of the flag of the Catholic young people, he gave a speech. And it's really incredible because in there he gives you a full dose of his spirituality. And Pierre Giorgio, people know about his works of charity. But what they don't know is he was driven, like he joined St. Vincent de Paul because World War I had just ended. And he saw the soldiers coming back. And that was a devastating war. There was an incident where 2,000 soldiers were killed, and he immediately said to the maid, I would give my life this day to end this war. Like, he was impacted by World War I a lot. Um, and so he joined St. Vincent de Paul primarily at the age of 17 as a way to help all of those soldiers returning and families that were suffering so much. And in that speech, he talks about three apostolates. Charity is just one of them. Um, but the biggest thing for Pier Giorgio was the apostolate of persuasion. And he believed that that was the most beautiful and necessary thing, which was to go to your friends and show them that there was a better, there was more to this world. And he said to convince them to follow the ways of God. Yes, he said there are thorns, but it's full of roses too. So what was the, that shows the real heart of Pier Giorgio. He said three apostolates good example that you have to be a, a catholic christian 24 7 persuasion get your friends to see that there's more to life and charity but persuasion was the biggest thing and and those are the, sto the stories that are fun about him how he would arrange a hike up in the mountains and have a priest meet them at some point and be like oh father well what a great surprise you know now we can you already <laughs> you know? but he did it in a he did persuasion in not a heavy-handed way mm -hmm. and i think that has a lot like this all new evangelization and all of the efforts we have right now with so many people who don't believe, don't go to church. Pierre Georgia would have gone after those people, but in a in a gentle way, like the stories of how he would play a game of billiards and say, if I win, 
you come for adoration for an hour. I gave a talk uh, last year actually in Austria uh, at a, uh, a week long parish kind of um, uh, what mission. And one of the young adults that drove me home uh, one of the nights said to me that the story of Pier Giorgio so inspired him that he was emboldened the next day to talk to a fellow a co-worker and the witness of just how Pier Giorgio would gently do it gave him the courage and he said and the guy was after he told him a little bit about him and of course brought up the mountain climbing you know Austria um, the guy was sorry he didn't he didn't go to the church himself and so it was the, the Pier Giorgio was so um, driven by the need to persuade and encourage and evangelize friends, but in a gentle, loving way. And so now he becomes like a tool or an instrument for us to evangelize. Because I find it very hard to approach people with all the scandals and things in the church. Almost as hard to go at it doctrinally in a certain sense. But it's it's a great entry point. Pier Giorgio is a great entry point for us to explain to somebody all of the good things and beautiful things about the church. So his, his um, spirituality, is, it's, it's not the right word, but he saw persuasion, persuasion. And I think it's good that that's the word he used. Mm -hmm. um, by, his, uh, by his own example, he was no hypocrite, as one of the most important, most beautiful, and most necessary things that we as Catholics could do. But he's known more for charity and, and service to the poor. I hear every description of him is service to the poor, service to the poor. But what he really wanted was to persuade people to follow the ways of God. And, and that was the key thing to him, often overlooked. Yeah, didn't he? he hated hypocrisy, anti-fascism, hated communism, socialism. You go down the line and it seemed like the, the man never even, you know, probably you know, said anything wrong, it seemed like. I mean, I mean he isn't corrupt, right? Right. I mean, so yeah. I mean, he was pretty pure <laughs> for that to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a one, one ending of a speech where he's, he's yelling at the people and goes, the gates of hell will never prevail against this church. Think Catholic people. I'm going, man, I love this guy. <laughs> well, and, he, and he, he hated the French at that time. He called them the sons of darkness. Like he didn't mince words. But one of the other beautiful things is if he did say something wrong, he, he would seek uh, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And one of the big incidents was when Mussolini came to power. And of course, he was furious about this. And there was a parade and his Catholic organization hung their banner out over the balcony, you know, in the parade. He was furious and he resigned. Like, how could you do that? How could you participate in that in any way? And he resigned. And then later he thought about it. And he basically said that, um, you know, if he had offended people, he was sorry. It's in the book of the letters. But he he didn't want his personal, uh, he didn't want to hurt the group. In other words, he wanted to do things the right way. So he'd be willing to help out and do things, but he wouldn't take leadership. So he had a gentle enough spirit to say, when I've done wrong, I'll ask forgiveness and apologize. But he didn't um, hold back when he felt strongly about something either. And I think the times when he had to apologize were rare because he knew how to hold his tongue in terms of little things like gossip and name calling. That wasn't Pier Giorgio. Um, he was um, really um, admirable, and I think his concern of seeing Christ in others, because he said, Jesus comes to me every day in communion. I repay him in my miserable way by visiting the poor. He saw Jesus in everyone. And right now, when everybody is so worried about their own health, Pierre Giorgio said it was what wealth it was to be in good health, and it would be betraying the gift of God to not go and do things um, and share your health with others. So, of course, he died from a contagious disease, which makes him also very relevant in the times we're living in, because he was fearless in that regard. He would go into places where people had leprosy and the worst diseases of all in the Catalengo there in Turin. So um, he practiced what he preached. And I, I think that's why with Pier Giorgio, you, you get, um, there's nothing fake about him, but he was real. and. We do that too many times, you know, we're so afraid to show who we really are. Yeah. He was who he was. and Everybody knew who he was. 
And so you could like him or not, but most people liked him. And even his, when he died, an atheist wrote a newspaper column about it was the most incredible funeral he'd ever been to. And just from what he witnessed at the funeral, he could say that this guy was something special, you know, just from his own witness of the outpouring of love to him. Why, why did his sister write so much about him? Were they that close or was, I'm sure they were that close, but what made her do all the writing? Yeah, they were close. They were, she says um, they were raised like twins, which they were, they were 16 months apart. And his mother, because I think of, because of the other daughter dying, put these two together and they were really, really close. But when Piotr Giorgio died, it was kind of like, I think when John Paul II died and there was an outcry for his uh, canonization, same thing with Piotr Giorgio, thousands of people at that funeral. And the family said, uh, you know, the father said to the mother, we did not know our son. How did these people know Piotr Giorgio? So there was a huge outcry for his canonization. And then it got put on hold because of an allegation that, hey, this guy is not so um, pure that you think he is. And the church in an exercise of extreme caution kind of like started to put the brakes on things. His mother died um, before the cause was ever reopened. But Luciana, uh, his sister, it bothered her that her brother who really didn't deserve it kind of had like a little, um, like not a black mark, uh, in a black mark in a sense, but there was a little bit of a cloud over him because of, you know, all of a sudden, Accusations. accusations were made and nothing was going forward. She she uh, had asked the Vatican basically to investigate that and remove that black mark because it was false. And I think in the course of all of that, she began to um, start putting his life out there. One of the things she wanted to do to clear his name, she started to put together all of his letters. His mother had gathered a lot of these things right after he died. And Luciana started to, for the sake of um, putting the truth out there about her brother, I think that's when she started uh, doing this. She was a poet and she wrote a lot. She wrote a huge volume set about her father. Um, she wrote a big, many big coffee table books like on Turin and Genoa and so on. So she was a writer but um, obviously for love of her brother and for wanting to set the record straight. And then she was affirmed in that effort. And then she put out a series of books about him. And that was long before uh, eventually the cause was reopened in the seventies. But so she did all of her writing beforehand. Uh, yeah, so I, that was a Holy Spirit thing really because without her doing that at the time, we today wouldn't have a lot of the things we have on him. Yeah, you, know, you got me so interested in that story that you don't want to share. I, that's all I can think about right now. <laughs> no, it's nothing big. It's just so <laughs> uh, So, where's the uh, is this cause kind of moving now? Is it still st stagnant or? Yeah, Pierre George, people always uh, have a confusion over canonization, but he needs to have you need to have one miracle proved before you're beatified and one after. And we've put out the story about Kevin Becker, a young man from New York who had a miraculous recovery from a fall, a brain injury. Mm -hmm. And we have that video on the website. And um, that he, his story is one of many actually incredible miraculous healings. But the way it works is things go to Rome and decades go by. You know, I, <laughs> I think this is a, I, what I've learned in all of this is why we don't have a lot of laity being uh, canonized. A lot of the times I've I've gotten this really bad habit now when I see the Vatican has announced uh, six people for canonization. I'll look at the list and go priest, none, priest, none, <laughs> which is like totally wrong on my part. I'm like, these are holy people being finally canonized. I'm like, come on, we need the lay people. But a lay person doesn't have an organization that goes on for 200 years. You know, think about some of these people get canonized after 300 years, but they have a religious community. Pierre Giorgio has the family. Yeah. So his sister died at the age of 105 and his uh, niece, Wanda, who is 92, and she's the one that I started to work with and uh, back in 2006, um, she's 92, she'll be 93 this year. So who is going to continue to promote his cause? And it's just the way the wheels turn in Rome. They have to validate a miracle 
And if they do, it could be tomorrow. So, I mean, the canonization could happen tomorrow if the miracle was approved today. So it really just depends on how things go over there. And I unfortunately have no control over it. And I do think that if the Vatican was in America, we'd have done this a long time ago. You know, there's a lot of, I always say it's my people, it's the way my people work. But if you've been to Italy, if you're Italian, if you have any experience of it, it's just the way things go. Uh, Things are slow. I talk too much, Steve. I give you a big, long answer over where things are going. Where things are going, he needs another miracle. There are plenty of things reported. They have to approve one. And and that's really it. We just have to pray. There's a canonization prayer on the website if people would just pray and specifically pray that if there are any obstacles holding that up, um, that they would be removed because I really think we need Saint Frasati. I mean, I really personally do. I think he's, um, I always say he's the antidote for whatever is wrong in our culture. He had money, looks, athleticism, powerful family connections, uh, friends, sense of humor, everything. Um, But he knew there was more, we need more. And he had the courage that we need in our culture today to stand up for the truth, to stand up for the church, to stand up for our country. Um, So we need need people, men and women of all ages like him. I think his canonization would be um, really a good thing. So I, I would implore for prayers on that behalf from everybody. Yeah, gentle guy, but also had a backbone that will stand up to the biggest tyrant or serious, Mm -hmm. serious one one time. But we'll joke to you. We'll laugh you under the table and have fun with you the entire night on the other side. So and obviously big prayerful guy. So he and in charge and in part of the state. So state and church kind of mesh in his mindset. In a sense, you can't have one without the other. Um, His feast day. Fourth of July. I like going around. I love it. Hey, are are they shooting fireworks for Independence Day or Pierre Giorgio's feast day? (laughs) I love it. Could that be any better? You know, one of the most famous quotes related, uh, associated with Pierre Giorgio, where he said, he wrote in a letter to live without the faith, without a patrimony to defend, meaning your homeland, Uh without having that to defend and without a steady struggle for the truth is not living. It's just existing. The rest of that letter, I recommend people to read because he talks about poor, unlucky those who don't have the faith. Because he got that um, desire to stand up for his homeland from his father. His father was a great patriot. So Pierre Giorgio and his father, I mean, they were great patriots. And he felt like if you didn't have a, a patrimony to, you know, a homeland to defend, which is so important, you know, that that was just a mere existence. And what good is it to just exist and get through your life? Well, heck, we need patriots um, to stand up for our Christian, Judeo-Christian values in this country. So for him to have 4th of July as a feast day, I just think that is so rich to me. I just, I can't, like, I love that. I'm like, that that is a gift to America in a way. I have a little running um, thing with his niece that I keep saying to her that his canonization will come from the U.S. And she'll give me a hard time, like, oh, the imperialist American who's going to. But I mean, his feast day is like our Independence Day. I mean, it's got to come from America. I mean, it's it's tailor made. It's meant to happen. Did, so yeah, I love that. Did JP two pick that day? Well, a lot of times it was the day they died. So he died on the Fourth of July. Okay. And a lot of times it's the day they died. That's if that day is available, it's kind of a norm. You uh-huh. know, it's, it's pretty much a habit. You'll see that for a lot of the saints. So he just conveniently for us, thank you, Pierre Giorgio, picked that day. His <laughs> grandmother died on July 1st, which the Canadians, you know, that's a Canadian Independence Day. And her death was closely linked to his. So it's interesting that um, he died then on the 4th of July. Yeah. And the incorruptibility, you mentioned that, you know, one of the... Um, Pier Giorgio's father was a well-known uh, political figure, and Mussolini did want to punish the family, forced him to sell his newspaper, La Stampa, and so on. And rumors got circulated about Pier Giorgio. I think a lot of that was um, geared toward punishing Mr. Frassati, Senator Frassati. He resigned his ambassadorship. And when Pier Giorgio died, uh, one, of the th- one of the rumors that circulated was that he had been buried alive and that he was actually trying to claw his way out of the coffin. His niece told me once, don't talk about that. But I mean, it's <clears throat> it's not a secret and it's it was just a bad rumor. When they opened his coffin uh, in 1981, as part of the process for just the canonization process of 
verifying if there are relics. Mm -hmm. They had a team of people that were there planning on spending several days to document, you know, bones and things like that. And when they opened the coffin, they saw this hair, the back of his hair, which is in a picture. You can see it in a picture when he's uh, dead before he was buried. It's on, I think it's on the website somewhere, but it's on the internet. Um, They saw that and they went, hmm, let's see what we have. And they pulled back that, uh, like shroud the cloth and he was perfect and his one niece uh, Giovanna said to me I'm a doubting Thomas and for me seeing is believing and that was the first time she ever saw her uncle you know in person he was dead but they pulled she said he was perfect a smile on his lips his eyes open and that not only was an incredible emotional thing for his sister and his nieces and nephews to see him but it put to rest all of the ugly stories that circulated for decades that he they were going to find him distorted trying to claw his way out of the cap the guy the guy was completely at peace and perfectly incorrupt and his coffin's been open several times uh, since then he remains incorrupt and then people naturally say well why don't we get to see his body and that's just a family choice um, they don't want to have him on display. And um, that's a whole other story, but it's it's just the, the option of the family. So, Very good. Well, where can people find more information, get the books, uh, and you know, learn more about Pierre Giorgio? Yeah, a great starting point is the website, www.frasadiusa.org. And from there, you can get right to the Facebook, Instagram, Twitter accounts. And we actually have a bookstore link on there. We have a great uh, religious community, the Sister Servants of the Eternal Word, that handle all of the bookstores. So I actually don't have anything anymore um, because they they take care of all of that. And you get to that all right from frasadiusa.org. There's chapters of Frasadi USA, right? Or, is, or am I confused with someone else? No, there are a lot of Frasati groups. That's how I got to know Pierre Giorgio. I moved to Nashville and my parish priest asked me to start a group. But there was never an organization like this. And so this organization is really information resource type. So we're not a membership. People sometimes think they can join. But there are um, organizations all around the country of young adults who have, and we have a list of a lot of those on the website. Um, There's organizations in other countries. It's not like the Knights of Columbus where it's all, you know, dictated codes and statutes and things it's really a holy spirit thing where somebody wants to have a group and under the charism of pierre giorgio so very uh, good well all that will be underneath in the show notes click the link go check out the website get the books you will not be disappointed in reading these books i promise you uh christine thank you very much for your time thank you steve i i I always say one of these days i'm going to just um like have somebody ring a bell when you want me to stop talking that's my italian side my italian side but um there's so much to learn and to love about Pier giorgio and i just it all just keeps coming out all the time so, i have thank to, you so I much have to fight bringing... myself i mean my uh, my mom's full-blooded uh, my uh, grandma's from it uh, from naples so uh yeah we got that same way i just saw some comments on a podcast i did last night I went for 12 minutes and they're saying, get to the point, stop yapping. I'm going, I, I didn't think I talked <laughs> <That's> enough, <me>. really. <laughs> That's me. My dad used to say, you give three talks, right? He said, you give one uh, before you give it, one that you give and one that you give on the way home. And on the way home, you're like, why did I say that? Why did I stop saying that? But the bottom line is, Peter Giorgio, get to know him. Just what you said, you won't be disappointed. Um, he's a great guide, a great friend and a great uh, spiritual um inspiration in the times that we live in for everybody so thanks for bringing him out oh, no problem but like i told you an email i dress if you, i don't know you, they can't see it on the screen there's a famous photo of him standing on the side of a mountain with the uh with the walking stick down and the pipe and so I see when it. i was in denver mm-hmm. i dressed like that at the gym i was working at and everyone came up who is that what why are you you dressed like a mountain climber I go actually it's this guy in italy named pierre giorgio and let me tell you a little bit about him kind of like how you talked about the persuasion they were blown mm-hmm. away. They never heard about these stories. So it's just like the church has all this gold that we can share. It's not that hard to do. And just stories like that sell. Yeah. And we make things a lot harder than they need to be. Uh, John Paul II in the beatification said, Peter Giorgio testifies that holiness is possible for everyone. Mm-hmm. It's not unattainable. 
um, he shows us that you can be a normal person and have a lot of fun, a sense of humor, friends, a life. Um, it doesn't, and, and it's the same true for religious. They don't stop being human beings and having fun and a life just because they're a priest or a nun or religious. So holiness is possible for everyone and it's not um, something we should be afraid of. Um, we just have to work at it, which is what he did. So, Amen to that. Well, Christine, thanks again and uh, hope to talk soon. All right. Thanks, Steve. God bless. Verso alto.